in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this would be of Jehoiakim, verse 2, Son of man, because that Tyrus, that old rock, have said against Jerusalem, Aha! She is broken. That was the gates of the people. She is turned unto me. I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. Now, now stop about and think about that a moment. Jerusalem was uh, protected by a pretty good-sized army. What, what is Tyrus? Why would Tyrus be anxious to see Jerusalem fall and then leaving basically the gate open right to them? They were traders. They knew they could trade or buy their way out of it. It's what they thought. I'm just entering these thoughts so that you keep up to speed here as we go along, understanding Kenites. Verse 3. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, you old rock, and will cause many nations to come up against thee as the sea causeth his waves to come up. You know what? Nebuchadnezzar never took it. Though it was, he was kind of ordered to, he sold out. As a servant of God, he sold out. It would be Alexander that would finally take it. Verse 4, And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. And you know something? It's still that way to this day. God always keeps his word. Verse 5, It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil to the nations. The name of the writer escapes me at the moment, but someone visited uh, Tyrus, this area. Seems to me like it was back in the 30s. And he said, you can still see that's all that's out there is fishermen with their little nets and so forth. Uh, that, that's meaningful to me. And I'll tell you something, basically today as well. It's meaningful to me because it documents God's word. He finished it. And, and, and bear in mind, it was the trading, it was the Wall Street, as I will compare the analogy of Wall Street today, it was the Wall Street of the world at that time. And it turned into Zippo, not a. Verse 6. And her daughters, which uh, are in the field, shall be slain by the sword, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Those in the field means her neighboring cities that would be uh, Zidon and so forth. Do you know what? They sold 30,000 into slavery. Okay, from this, historically, I believe it's Josephus has a record of that in the Antiquities. But you, you don't have to worry. They'll, they'll get their self bought out pretty quick. Okay, verse 7. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings. Boy, that sounds pretty neat, doesn't it? And with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much more. There's just one problem if there isn't a road built out to it, chariots can't fight in the water. They found that out, and Pharaoh found that out uh, in Egypt, did he not? Okay. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 27, verse 6, you're going to find it written there where God says, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. God utilizes countries to cause his prophecies to come to pass. As it is written, so it shall be. That's why you can take great confidence in your Father's Word. Simply read it with understanding. What does this have to do with you today? The king of Babylon is coming again. God's going to allow it. And it is none other than the king of Tyrus. They both fold into one. Because Tyrus is Satan. And Satan, when, as it is written in Revelation 12, 7, is cast to this earth then he becomes the king of Babylon of the great book of Revelation. Understand why there is so much written about this rock that is not our rock. I don't know, which rock are you standing on? The first one that appears soon? Be careful, friend. He's a fake. Verse 8. 
He shall slay with the sword the daughters in the field, and he shall make a fort against thee, and cast a mount against thee, and lift up a buckler against thee. This he did, but he got bought out, okay, before he, um, they paid him off before it was finished, total, nine. And he shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with her, his axes he shall break down thy towers. There's just one problem. Nebuchadnezzar was a land army, and you have to have an amphibious invasion force to take a place like Tyrus. He didn't have it. Alexander solved the problem again, as I said, by building a dike or road out to it. Ten, by reason of the abundance of his horses, their dust shall cover thee. Thy walls shall shake at the noise of the horsemen and of the wheels and of the chariots when he shall enter into thy gates as men enter into a city wherein is made a breach. And actually, it would uh, basically come to pass, but it would be kind of like uh, when you're bought off, sold out, you don't do much to the gates. But God still kept his word. Alexander took care of it. Eleven, with the hooves of his horses shall be he tread down all thy streets. He shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrison shall go down to the ground. Verse 12, and they, who is they here? It's important that you know. It's Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander. They shall make a spoil of thy riches, and make a prey of thy merchandise. And hey, there was a bunch of it, friend. Those old ships of Tortius, uh, Many times those sa the sails are mentioned as the white clouds on the sunset of the trafficking in metals and cotton and beautiful things. And they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses, your houses of desire, and they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. And that they did ultimately, but it would take both of them. I want you to know God wasn't missing anything when he says they. Verse 13, and I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease. You're not going to have something to sing about, friend. And the sound of thy harp shall be no more heard. Uh, are you beginning to catch on to this? Revelation 18, 22. Oh, the long, sad faces, how is she fallen, the great city, the great city Babylon. You just almost like reading the book of Revelation, okay, with the fall and this being the type for that one that is to come. How are you fixed, friend? You ready for it? Verse 13, and I will make thee like the top of a rock, and that's exactly what it is. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And it never has been. God keeps his word. I would feel sorry for one that wanted to build on it. They would never have, written, have read that scripture. God would destroy it. 15. Thus saith the Lord God to Tyrus, that old rock, the fake. Shall not the isle shake at the sound of thy fall when thy wounded cry, when the wounded cry, when the slaughter is made in the midst of thee? Boy, I'll tell you what, it does in that old inn when we're no one to buy our goods anymore. 16. Then all the princes of the sea shall come down from their thrones and lay away their robes and put off their broidered garments. They shall clothe themselves with trembling. They shall sit upon the ground and shall tremble at every moment and be astonished at thee. Our Father is capable, and he did. Like I said, 30,000 sold into slavery. 17. And they shall take up a lamentation for thee and say to thee, How art thou destroyed? Thou wast inhabited of seafaring men. The renowned city, which was strong in the sea, she and her inhabitants, which caused their terror to be on all that hunt it. Uh, hunt it. Uh, 
In other words, she had the largest navy in the world. And, of course, this, again, would remind me of Revelation chapter 18 again, but verse 9 this time. How is she, God, our, our great city? 18. Now shall the isles tremble in the day of thy fall. Yea, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled at thy departure. In a prophetic sense, understand isles mean all the coast of the world. That's what the term means. Every shore, every coast in the world, meaning all countries of the world. 19. For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great waters shall cover thee. Do you want to know what those waters are in the biblical sense? You'll read of it in Revelation chapter 17. The waters are the people of the world. They're going to swarm. And out of the waters of the sea, so to speak, people shall rise a one-world political system all over again, just as Tyrus was this time. The old dragon is Tyrus, the old dragon that is called the devil, as it is written in Revelation 12, 7, verse 20. When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit. Do you need any more help with it? Do you know who descends into the pit? The abyss. It's Satan, of course, all through the millennium, as we'll learn when we get to chapter 40 and past. With the people of old time. And shall set thee in the low parts of the earth in places desolate of old with them that go down to the pit, that thou be not inhabited, and I shall set glory in the land of the living. What it's saying here is you're not going to be a part of the living. When does that come to pass? You should know. Revelation chapter 20, when Satan is raised from, allowed from the pit for a very short season at the end of the millennium, which this book covers from chapter 40 all the way to the end, the millennium, he walks straight into the lake of fire, God being that fire, and he's destroyed. As you're going to learn in chapter 28, he's turned to ashes from within. That means forever and ever. Gone. Destroyed. Now, if you had a little trouble following or understanding we're talking about Satan by utilizing the name Tyre, that is to say, who is the king of it? If the fact of the pit, the abyss, did not uh, inform you, have, then you would never have read, as well as the New Testament, Isaiah chapter 14, where it states very clearly there that it is Lucifer that is cast into the pit. And the world says, is this the man that deceived the whole world? You bet it is. I hope he doesn't deceive you. Think about it. I was quoting from Isaiah chapter 14, verse 21 uh, of, uh, of uh, Ezekiel 26. I will make thee a terror, and thou shalt be no more. Though thou be sought for, yet shalt thou never be found again, saith the Lord God. That certainly hasn't come to pass yet. But it will. And it comes to pass at the end as it is written of Revelation chapter 20. It's called the second death for those that want to participate in it. Do you know what the second death is? The first is death of the flesh. The second death is the death of the soul. He will never be among the living any longer. And the word living there means eternal life. Chapter 27, verse 1. Tyrus is going to be explained here in his whole operation as the analogy of a ship. And you've got to get that straight in your mind or you're, you're, you're not going to follow. Ty, Tyrus' whole operation, or I could say Satan's whole operation, king of Babylon of the New Testament revelation, is, the, is the, used as the analogy here of a ship. What keeps it afloat? how he operates, going to be giving you his M.O. Are you ready for it? How sharp are you? 
The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Two, now thou son of man, take up a lamentation of Tyrus. That means you sing a sad old song about this phony rock. Three. And say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, which art a merchant of the people for many isles, the whole world, thus saith the Lord God, O Tyrus, thou hast said, I am of perfect beauty. Do you know that that's the words that Tyrus calls and God himself said when he was the protecting cherub, and Satan was at one time. And we'll document it in the next lecture after this or the soon after that. He was, God said, I made you the full pattern in the Hebrew. I, I made you perfect in beauty. He was quite a looker. Do you know something? He can be very effective in his miracles when he comes as the spurious Messiah, save I've come and his message will be, I've come to rapture you away. How many know? And how many are educated in God's word? It'll be interesting. You know, these car bumpers, you see, this car could be empty because I could be raptured at any moment. All of them are going to be the first ones taken from the field, and they're going to jump right in bed with him. That's who they're taken by, is Tyrus. Why? Biblically illiterate. Listen to too many traditions of men. I'm just making friends and influencing people, beloved, but I am a teacher of God's word, and I will make no apology for his word. Verse 4. Thy borders are in the midst of the seas. Thy builders have perfected thy beauty. Oh, you're sharp. You're a smart one. Wise, I guess. And don't ever, think, don't ever sell Satan short, friend. Are you going to end up behind the eight ball? Five, they have made all thy shipboards of fir trees of Sinar. That is snow mountain. That means the cedars of Lebanon, quite frankly. That have taken cedars from Lebanon to make mast for thee. Do you know, um, and it's important that you break this ship down and look at it a little more in depth. Do you know who the cedars of Lebanon uh, represent? God says, I am a great fir tree and the minor prophets. It's our people. And uh, the cedars of Lebanon are, have always represented our people. What does the mass do of a ship? It drives it. It produces the energy and the spoils to drive Satan's old ship. Kind of ironic, is it not? Well, what's new under the sun? Satan's always made it that way. Very important that you make note of that. Verse 6. Of the oaks of Bashan, Bashan means fruitful. I mean, they were big. Have they made thine oars? Boy, you never break one of them. The company of the Asherites have made thy benches of ivory brought out of the isles of Chittim. Now, I, I'm sorry, there is a mistranslation here in the uh, Maserat documents that you with companion Bibles, you will have a Maseratic note by Ginsburg, and you will note that, and this will come up again in the 31st chapter of Ezekiel. Asher has no uh, article here, okay? Just doesn't, all right? so. It should be T. Asher, which means boxwood. That's all it amounts to. Satan wanted to be a cedar of Lebanon, but he's just a, he's just a, a filthy old box cedar, T. Asher. And that's how the word Asher was mistranslated, but the Asherites having no article with Satan's buggy, all right? And the word company should be translated daughters, all right? But be that as it may, you box wood, that means the fakishness of it. It looks beautiful, but it, it's, it's not sound, okay? Not made of the good stuff other than the mast, okay? Brought out of the isles of Chittim. Chittim, the word Chittim in the Hebrew tongue means the bruisers. And God's elect are referred to as bruisers because we're going to bruise Satan's head. Jesus Christ will sit at the throne of God until his enemies are made his footstool. Who do you think is going to do with his enemies? Verse 7. 
his election, of course. That's why Mark 13 stipulates what they shall do with God's help. Verse 7 reads, Fine linen with broidered work from Egypt was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail. Whoa, think about it. Blue and purple, that's royalty from the isles of Elisha. Uh, let's just say Yah's salvation even was that which covered thee. Oh, you look so religious. Your whole city, the town, everything, it just seemed like the way to go. Especially when you cry, that little cry of yours, I've come to, to, to rapture, fly you away. Eight, the inhabitants of Zidon, like I described, this is right on the coast, very short distance from the island itself. And Arvad, Arvad means rolling, all right, not stable, roll, roving, were thy mariners. Mariners meaning your hunters, thy wise men. Good traders, buddy, I'll tell you for sure. O Tyrus, that were in thee, were thy, uh, that were in thee, were thy pilots. They engineered the whole thing. They were good. Of course, that's Kenites, all right? Nine, the ancients of Gebel, uh, the mountain, and the wise men thereof were in thee, thy caulkers. All the ships of the sea with thy mariners were in thee to occupy thy merchandise. To occupy means to trade with, all right? It's like when Jesus told you to occupy till he comes back in the New Testament, same mistranslation. He said, what I give you in truth, you trade with it. That means plant seeds. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you are um, familiar with um, uh, marine terminology as far as caulking or something of this nature. Do you know what caulking does? Got good old boards and everything, but they kind of, uh, with age and so forth, they've got cracks in it, and they won't come together close enough to actually hold water. So you've got to have, usually it's a, a fibrous, cotton-like material uh, dipped in a, a pitch of a certain kind, and they take malls and drive that into those cracks so that the old thing floats. What it's saying is your traders in your commerce are what keeps your old boat afloat. Got it? These things are very important, beloved, especially in this end generation. God is telling you exactly the MO, method of operation, of Satan, okay? And um, uh, so it goes. Verse 10. They of Persia, you know who that is today? Right Iran. And of Lud and of Put, right Libya, were in thine army, thy men of war. They hang the shield and helmet in thee. They set forth their comeliness. Hey, they, they were mercenaries. Do you know something? It was, the sad part is, is um, in Satan uses Christian mercenaries. They'll do their fighting for him. And when governments uh, are not careful, it can happen again, friend. The mercenaries that hang there, you know, there, there's a reason America is a superpower of superpowers. I'll say no more on that, a different subject for a different time. Verse 11, the men of Arved, those wandering ones, roving boys, with thine army were upon thy walls round about, that means they were, they were protecting, and the Gamadines, thems, were in thy towers, they hang their shields upon thy walls round about, they have made thy beauty perfect. Boy, you had it made. You had the, the um, uh, Gamadines means warriors. Right? You had a mercenary armor, army to protect you. The whole world would fight for you because of your uh, bargaining and trading and treaties. Twelve. Tortius was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kind of riches, with silver, iron, tin, and lead, they traded in thy fairs. It's amazing, you know, that many of these things were brought in from all over the world there when you study the history of the thing. 
But I want you to note there was no gold mentioned there. It wasn't mentioned, but don't worry, some of it stuck. 13, Javan, Tubal, and Meshach. Kind of liked Esau a little bit. These are cities of Esau, okay? Russia of today. It has nothing to do with Russian Christians or the people. It's the system, communism. Were thy merchants, they traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. They, they were practicing slave trade. They were slave traders. It had a lot to do with it, uh, he's saying. 14. They of the house of uh, to Garma traded in thy fairs with horses and horsemen and mules. And of course, uh, again, we're still, uh, let's go one more verse and we'll explain. 15. The men of Dedan, Rhodes, son of Cush, here even, were the south, a little southern Russia, so to speak, were the, thy merchants. Many isles were the, thy, the merchandise of thine hand. They brought thee for a present horns of ivory and ebony from Africa, of course. They, they um, sailed from Tyre to the West Mediterranean and uh, from Izan Geber to Ofri, that's where the finest gold in the world was, Arabia, India, and East Africa, okay? Just to put it, bring that all up into modern English with Iran included, as well as Edom, Russia. 16, Syria was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of the wares of thy making. They occupied in, the, in thy fairs with emeralds, purple, embroidered work, and fine linen, and coral and agate. Oh, it was so beautiful. It was so pretty. You know, people can say what they want, but some of the most beautiful uh, icons in history you will find in Esau, Russia. They've got some beautiful, beautiful work there all right and many of you have or may, maybe have not but yeah. this would go back to when czar the czar which is written of in the minor prophets was there and uh, managed the area and then he and his whole family were executed which i feel is recorded in the minor prophets of history and um, the country kind of went to where it is today, not a top notcher. And I'm not talking about the people here, I'm talking about the systems. Verse 17, Judah and the land of Israel, they, that's both houses now, okay, they were thy merchants, oh boy. They traded in thy market wheat of Mineth, they distributed it and panag and honey and oil and balm. Do you know, there have been, uh, I'm not gonna go into any history, recent history, but we have given away enough grain, and, and I, I, you know, and to feed people that are starving, that's fine. But we have been tricked a few times by giving away more grain to even run ourselves short to cause our own economy to go on the rocks, basically, I feel purposely to wound this nation. It happens with petrol, grains, and so forth. And when you have, oh well, verse 18. Damascus was thy merchant in the multitude of the wares of thy making. For the multitude of all riches in the wine of Helbun, Helbun, fertile, and uh, white wool, just all kinds of goodies from the world. 19, Dan also and Javan going to and fro, occupied in thy fairs, bright iron, Kesa and Calamus were in thy markets. I'll tell you this, it's amazing, but there is so much truth, beloved, in what is written here. Don't ever forget it, all right? It will come together for you as we move along here. 20. Dedan was thy merchant in precious clothes and chariot, for chariots. Best, I mean best saddle cloth in the world. Verse uh, 21. Arabia 
And all the princes of Kedar, they occupied with thee in lambs and rams and goats, and these were they thy merchants. Now, you know why the house of Israel and the house of Judah are saying they were your traders and merchants? Because Arabs won't raise sheep, okay? This is why you must be familiar in your historical findings of the Hyksos or um, the, um, the shepherd kings of Egypt to know that they were of the house of Israel, okay? And um, you can see how they were used within this. I will say no more on that subject. Verse 22. The merchants of Sheba and of Rehemah, they were thy merchants. They occupied in, the fair, in thy fairs with chief of all spices and with all precious stones and gold. You got them, and here we got gold comes in. Where is it today from Arabia? It's called black gold. How much, how much oil, how much money does the world pour back into that area because of the black gold that comes from those coasts? It's written. It's happening. How are you doing? Just be aware. That's what's important. One more verse, and we're going to stop for today. 23, Haran and Cana and Eden, the merchants of Sheba, the old Asher, and Chilmad were thy merchants. It's near Baghdad. On and on it goes. Uh, let's see how much. We've got too much to finish in this chapter. We're going to stop there for today. Okay? But this is so important, and it's important that you note that he likened and utilized the analogy of a ship to keep the whole thing floating for the king of Tyrus. We'll find out in the next lecture or the one preceding uh, following that from God's word, absolute identity of who we're talking about, and it is none other than Satan playing the role, Lucifer, the old devil, the dragon, playing false Christ. He's always wanted to, and in the 28th chapter, we'll document it. Hey, when it said of old a few verses back, it didn't, well, it was in the last chapter, as a matter of fact, of closing it. Of old meant even in the first earth age. Don't forget it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?